So I'm Emily. I'm the data infrastructure lead at Drizzly. To answer the question about my favorite alcoholic beverage, I would say I'm pretty into sours lately. There's a lot to explore there. But yeah, let's get it going. Awesome. So yeah, this for this talk, I'm going to be talking about how we're using metadata provided through dbt artifacts, namely called run results, and how we're kind of using that to track our dbt project performance day to day and just over time. So in terms of what we're going to go through, we're going to talk a little bit about Drizzly, go through kind of our version one of these run audits, go into v2 where we really improved this process and then how we're currently visualizing and operationalizing this data, and then some next steps we're thinking about. So for those who maybe haven't heard of Drizzly, we are the world's largest alcohol marketplace, and our mission is to be there when it matters, committed to life's moments and the people who create them. And we partner with over 1,200, well, with like 3,000 plus retail stores in over 1,200 cities across North America. We also have three consumer facing platforms. So we have drizzly.com, our website, and then we also have an app for iOS and Android. So definitely check those out. In terms of what our data team looks like, underneath analytics, we have data engineering, business intelligence, and data science. And within that, we focus on a couple different verticals within the business. So for example, product operations, strategic partnerships, and marketing. And we're also hiring for a couple roles right now. So if you're interested, definitely check out our career site. I can link that in the Slack channel after this. All right, so let's get into it. I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of why we wanted to start tracking our DBT model performance and some of the reasons that we kind of just started on this journey of DBT metadata. So we started using DBT around June or July of 2019 when our BI team was a small uh, but mighty force of around three BI analysts. So DBT really allowed us to build that like data system that we wanted. And our team is now up to 13. And of course, this year we all went remote and it was much harder to kind of track and make sure everybody's DBT models were optimized. It was hard to have visibility into what every single person on the team was building. So we really wanted to have insight into how our models were behaving over time. Something our data engineer, Dennis, said that I liked was it's easy to write a query it's hard to write a good query. And I think overall, it's kind of hard to track model behavior and scalability during that development cycle. So this data could give us insight into how our DBT models were growing and behaving over time. A couple other things we were thinking about were that we wanted this to act like any other data source. We wanted to be able to query it, analyze it. We wanted to be able to bring it into Looker and visualize it. So those were kind of all things we were keeping in mind as we were planning out our initial phases of bringing in this metadata. So that brings us into kind of version one of this. So kind of what we were doing in version one was a lot of inserting records, a lot of custom DBT macros, which I'll go into in the next slide. So we had a lot of, we had pre and post hooks within our DBT project that would call this other macro on the right here called model logging. And this would fire off at the start of a model run and at the end. So at the start, we would call this macro and it would insert a bunch of this data so things we had available to us were things in the information schema in Snowflake. So things like the row count, if there were any clustering keys, the table type, things like that. 
And then we also had things available that we could reference through the ginger relations, like this table, model name. So those were what we had available kind of in version one, just based on this method. So basically what would happen is there'd be two inserts per model, one at the start and one at the end. But there are some issues with this approach. So there's a lot of custom macros to manage here. As you could see, it's not super easy to read. It slowed down our runs because we had these pre and post hooks firing off at the start and end of each model. So at about 472 models, that was about 944 inserts per dbt run if we when we ran our entire project so that definitely a lot um, going on there and then additionally we just had a, had minimal metadata available so as i mentioned on the previous slide we had what was available in the information schema and then what we could reference through the those ginger relations so for example if a model erred that post hook just would not fire off. So we just wouldn't have that row available for that model. Or if a model skipped because of an upstream error, the pre and post hooks would just not fire at all. So we'd have no rows for those models. So it wasn't really great for tracking things like errors or skips. And then additional metadata like model tags, for example, weren't really readily available. So that brings us to version two, where we started using run results, which is a DBT artifact. It's you know generated by each DBT run. So before I go into that, I wanna start with a little bit of background. So I actually submitted version one of this as my coalesce talk. We had kind of all the data set up. We were visualizing and using some of it around like run times but I ended up getting on a call with Claire after I submitted my talk and basically she had a hunch that there was a better way we could be accomplishing this. So she connected me with Jeremy, who is resident expert in all things product for DBT. And pretty much he was like, hey, there's this artifact called run results. I think it could kind of solve what you guys are looking for. Let's test it out. So this was kind of an experiment. And obviously it went really well, or I wouldn't be here today. So let's get into kind of how we started implementing that and replacing our old method. So some additional background is that we were implementing Dagster at this time to be our data orchestration tool. And they're actually giving a talk tomorrow, so definitely check them out. This is just from their homepage, their data orchestrator and they work really well with dbt i know they just put out a blog out about using dbt and dagster together they have a lot of pre-built components for dbt so it was really nice to set this up and dagster really is what allowed us to easily implement this new method of using the dbt artifact run results so before we were on dagster dbt was executed via ECS and in this way it was kind of hard to change our DAG. There wasn't really testing capabilities before pushing something into production but things like you know dbt run, dbt seed, dbt test those were those were pretty straightforward to implement but kind of things with more complex logic were a little bit trickier. So with Dagster, it made it really easy to add this, these extra steps we needed to ingest this metadata. Dagster is open source and it could be deployed within our AWS environment. We could easily change our DAG execution in the Dagster UI and Dagster has so much great testing functionality before you need to push something into production. So this kind of gave us the base to um, start ingesting this metadata to work with. So with Dagster, we were able to remove those pre and post hooks from our project, remove those macros. And instead we just added one extra step after a DBT run to ingest this run results JSON file 
um, into S3 after our DVT run. And we used Snowflake, so then we were able to set up a snow pipe, which would then ingest this data into, into Snowflake. And then just overall, Dagster became a really great place for analysts to perform ad hoc DBT runs. And then there's also a thing called presets where we could set up these specific templates to make sure that if an analyst is running an ad hoc run against production, we can make sure that these sorts of steps like ingesting the metadata just always occur. So this is what our DAG looks like in Dagster, our DBT DAG. And I won't go through all of the steps, just kind of want to point out where run results sits in relation to the rest of the steps here. So it just happens right after our DBT run completes. So I'm going to double click into run results to kind of see what's actually going on. So once our DBT run finishes, the run results step can kick off. And during production runs, it will upload that run results JSON file into S3, which then triggers our snow pipe to append the new results into the raw table in Snowflake. And with Snowflake's like really great functionality with JSON and semi-structured data, we can save all of the parsing and flattening for our DBT model. So then we have a really nice history of our DBT runs for each model for each day. So going kind of into what this code actually looks like in DBT, this is kind of just a really small snippet of what the run results JSON looks like. It's a huge JSON file. It has, you know, data for every single model that runs in your project. So it has things about the run and then also other metadata about the model. So we have our raw table set up as a source in our DBT project. And it's just the two columns, the date that it was created, and then just the huge JSON blob as a variant in Snowflake. So from there, we're able to actually create our DBT models to parse out this data. So our main one is this DBT modeling model. And we first can just like flatten all the JSON and then we can pull out the values that we're interested in. So this is just a really small snippet, but we can see there are things like the unique ID of the model, uh, the model runtime, the run status, if there was an error, if there was an error, we can actually uh, see what the error message was and a lot more. And I'm actually going to publish a, a discourse article after this that will have more in-depth versions of this code. So if anyone's interested in, in that, I'll be posting that shortly after this. We also have a stale models model that I'll go through in the next section a little bit more, but basically it allows us to see if any models are stale, as in they haven't updated for various reasons, which I'll go, I'll go through a little bit later. So we actually have seen a lot of improvements since switching to this new method. Our runtime is down about 15 to 20%, which will actually save us a couple grand in Snowflake costs per year. And that's mostly from getting, getting to remove all of those insert statements that were happening in our previous method. And additionally, we just have uh, much richer metadata available. So we ha actually have error messages. We'll have rows for models that aired and skipped so we can actually monitor and alert on those things. And then we just have a lot more metadata available about each of our models, like their references and tags and dependent macros and other nodes that they depend on. So most importantly, how are we actually using this data and visualizing it? So we use Looker. I was able to create this Looker dashboard based on one of the DBT models. And we have a couple sections here. This is just kind of the first section that shows our current day run stats and then any model errors that occurred. So we can see the total models that ran, any model errors that occurred, any models that skipped, and then the total runtime. 
if there are model errors, we'll be able to actually see each model that aired or skipped, some other metadata about the models, if they're incremental or a table, if they're a view, their tags, which give us some important information, and then the actual error messages that happened. So in this way, it makes it really easy for analysts to kind of troubleshoot what happened if something aired and easily see what all needs to be rerun after the bug is fixed. Additionally, in Looker, you can set up alerting. So based on these models, we're able to set up alerts to send to our analytics alert Slack channel, which will let us know if a model has errored, and then we can link directly to the dashboard and dig in further. Some other views we have in here are model runtime. So we can see how long models are taking to run. We can see what our longest running models are. Maybe we want to kind of see how we can optimize some of those if they start to take up too many resources. Stale models, like I mentioned earlier, there's a couple reasons a model could be stale. Either if it aired or skipped, it's going to be like one day stale until we rerun it. If a model was deleted or renamed from our project, it's going to be stale because it's kind of the old version of what's in Snowflake. So we're trying to think about a good way to kind of automate alerting around this and automate kind of like dropping stale tables after, you know, some sort of threshold. So that's something we're currently thinking about as an addition to um, all of this. And then lastly, we really wanted to be able to layer this data with other data in our database. So this is model runtime of one of our event models for our clickstream data. So it's aggregated event count or row count by day along with that model specific runtime. So besides this random spike, something else happened that day, we can kind of look at how model runtime is trending with row count or event count. And in this way, we could kind of audit if a model starting to take too long and we see row count is really starting to increase along with model runtime, we could kind of dig in there and see if there are ways that we could optimize that specific model. So we really have enjoyed this new process and we really just want more metadata to work with. So we want to explore other use cases for run results. We want to implement it for DBT tests so we can see how our tests are performing. And then we also want to explore using another DBT artifact called Manifest, which just contains much more metadata about each model. And then we also want just want to start adding more alerting through Looker possibly looking into troubling model trends. If a model starts to take too long to run, we can kind of dig in there. And then stale models, as I mentioned um, previously. So if anyone has any questions, definitely Slack us. I'll be there right after this. And I'll be posting that discourse article shortly, which will contain more kind of technical details about each step of our implementation here.